Hey guys, my name's Sam and welcome to Prep Medic. In this week's video, I will show you how to insert an intraosseous needle. All right guys, so in this week's video, we are discussing an intraosseous needle. I'm gonna go through the basic anatomy physiology of a bone, exactly what an IO is, and then we're gonna talk about different insertion sites, and finally, I will show you how to actually insert one of these. Now, this video is for training purposes only for refreshers or for EMTs, paramedics just starting out that are looking for a video that kind of demonstrate this skill and go through it start to finish. I will try to leave some time codes down below so you can identify exactly what I'm talking about each different section of this procedure. Getting into the video, what exactly is an IO? Well, an IO stands for intraosseous, similar to IV standing for intravenous. This is simply a way for us to give medications to a patient when we cannot establish an IV in a rapid amount of time. So any medication that can be given IV can be given through an IO, which is kind of neat. The advantages of this procedure are that it takes about 20 seconds start to finish to get one of these in. It also has about double the success rate of an IV. Downsides are it's kind of a scary looking procedure and number two, it can be very painful for the patient receiving this procedure. So it is not for everybody, but in extreme emergent situations, this is a great tool and actually carries with it not too many harmful effects over that of an IV. The textbook indications for an IO are when an IV is not successful or when IV insertion will take a prolonged amount of time in patients that need rapid medication administration. Traditionally, this is in cardiac arrest. It doesn't matter that this procedure is more painful simply because the patient is unresponsive and can't perceive the pain. However, this device can be used in conscious patients. There are certain ways that we'll talk about later to reduce the pain of this procedure. And then we oftentimes use this in severe shock states where we cannot get an IV because they are so vasoconstricted. The contraindications for this device or reasons why we would not start an IO are going to be a fracture in the targeted bone, previous orthopedic procedure at the site, so like a joint replacement, something like that, another IO in the same site within 48 hours, or the absence of anatomic landmarks. The last one is kind of a relative contraindications. Oftentimes we'll be able to get a general idea and as long as we're not going into a joint and we know kind of where we're going, this can still be successful. So a little bit of basic anatomy of the bone and I'm not gonna go super in depth, so don't worry. The outermost layer is called the periosteum. Beneath that, you have the intramedullary space, which is filled with bone marrow. And this is where most of your blood production for your entire body comes from. Actually, 95% of your blood cells are actually produced in your bone. So that's where we actually want to get this needle because obviously, because your blood is produced, there it is very vascular and is very easy to get this into circulation, which is why IOs work. There are a number of different sites that we can use for IO insertion. The two primary ones that we're gonna be talking about today and that I will actually demonstrate for you are going to be your proximal humerus here and also your proximal tibia. Those are kind of traditional in EMS. Some other sites, some older military guys might have seen the sternal IOs. This was utilized in the military simply because in an IED blast, somebody might be missing their arms and legs and then traditional IO insertion would not work. This has been phased out relatively universally uh, because it did have some complications that came along with it, but you may still see devices for this type of insertion. You also sometimes see distal femur and distal tibia, although once again, those are slightly less common. So next up, let's talk about some of the equipment that you actually need to start an IO. First and foremost, you need a driver and a needle set to begin this procedure. So a driver is basically a drill. It is something that will allow you to spin the needle and apply downward pressure evenly to actually insert the needle into the bone. Now the one I have here is the SAM Medical IO driver. I like this one because it is not electronic, it doesn't run out of batteries, and it gives you a tactile feel as you are inserting it. That being said, this is not a review of this product. At work, we use the Easy IO, which is actually a powered drill. You also have Jamshidis, which are just a needle set that you manually push into the patient. This is a little bit more old school and it's not used a whole lot anymore, especially because most of these IO needles can be inserted manually 
if the driver fails, breaks, or runs out of batteries, uh, you name it. So this one here, I've got the driver, I have the needle attached. Now the needles come in three main sizes. So you have your small, medium, and large. Uh, these are not like they're commonly thought of, uh, peds, adult, bariatric, even though that's oftentimes uh, how they're inserted. But you have the pink needle, which is a 15 millimeter needle. It's 15 gauge. Uh, and this is for patients between three and 39 kilograms. It's a very short needle and is basically used for somebody that doesn't have any adipose tissue or fat tissue over the site that you're using. Generally speaking, this will be your smaller pediatrics. And that being said, IOs are great for your neonates, your really small children, uh, because you can start these relatively easily. Next up, we have the blue needle. So this is a 25 millimeter, 15 gauge needle. And this is for patients over three kilograms, generally speaking. The cool thing about IOs is that you can actually start one of the yellow large needles on your smallest patient. You just don't insert it all the way. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So you have the blue one. These weight, ga these weight sizes are just kind of a general guideline, um, but it really depends on your patient. I generally find the blue needle is the best for the proximal tibia um, because they don't have a ton of adipose tissue there. And this is really great for adults. Uh, last but not least, we have your yellow needle. So this is a 45 millimeter needle. That's what I have on here. And you can see it's absolutely massive. Uh, and this is a 15 gauge needle. It is recommended for patients 40 kilograms or older. But like I said, this is oftentimes good for your patients with a proximal humerus insertion site because we have a little bit more adipose tissue there, even if they aren't a bariatric patient. And once again, you can insert this on relatively small patients. So let's say you have one of each of these needles, you tried to insert this, it fails, you can go to this and still insert it in a patient successfully. It will just stick out a little bit farther. So we've got the driver, we've got the needle, we've selected the right one for the site and the patient uh, that we're doing this on. Next up, we need a loop and a flush. So I've got the loop that comes with this packaging. Most will come in the needle set. You can see I've got one right there. And I'm gonna connect a flush. I don't wanna to touch either ends of these because they're both sterile areas. We don't wanna introduce any uh, potential debris or bacteria into the IO because it can cause very nasty infections. And then I'm going to just flush saline through it until it starts coming out this end. And that's gonna ensure that I'm not giving somebody an air embolism when I'm pushing that through. I don't wanna be flushing air into that bone and that vascular space. I have some way to swab and clean the site. Here, I've got a chloroprep swab, this chlorhexidine, works really well. Use whatever your facility recommends, um, whether that's an alcohol swab, chloroprep, or some other agent. Um, just make sure you're cleaning the site well before you insert this because we don't wanna be making the patient worse with infection down the road. And then finally, we want a some kind of sharps container. I'm not actually gonna use this today because I wanna reuse this needle for other demonstrations and some way to secure the IO in place. So this is the com commercial securing device from Sam. Um, I like using these if you have them, they take up a lot of space and sometimes you don't have that much room in your kit. So if you don't have one of these, you can't afford them, you can't find them, you can't fit them, whatever. You can take bulky dressings, you can put them on either side of the IO, you can tape around it, you can tape the IO itself, even though that's not the best. But the best thing you can do for an IO is just make sure people know it's there and protect it at all costs. Unlike an IV, these needles will stick straight out of the patient, so they're really easy to hit, bend, damage, or dislodge. Just be really careful once they're inserted. All of that being said, once this is in the bone, it is very stable within that. It's not jiggling around and there's not a ton of danger of it coming out. So let's move on to site identification. Like I said, the two sites we are talking about today are going to be your proximal humerus and your proximal tibia. Now, I personally like the proximal humerus because it allows for a little bit of a faster fluid flow. It's a little bit less painful for patients having this done if they're conscious. And then it also keeps it somewhere easily accessible, especially in a helicopter, you can get to the top of their body a lot easier than their legs. However, the proximal tibia is great for cardiac arrest cases in my experience, because in those cases you have people doing CPR up here, you got somebody doing the airway, 
and it gets really cluttered at this part of the patient's body. So going down to the legs, it just allows who's ever administering medications in that cardiac arrest to kind of be out of the way and not interfering with compressions, which we all know are the hallmark of a good CPR or cardiac arrest. All right, so when we are inserting the IO into the proximal humerus, the first thing we need to do is get the patient into the right position. So we take their arm and we're actually gonna rest their arm over their stomach. Some people like taking their arm and actually putting it by their side and just rotating it inward. The main reason for this is we wanna get the biceps tendon out of the way so we don't accidentally hit that. That's a big no-no in this procedure. So the next portion of this is we're gonna take one hand, we're gonna blade it right at the axilla, so right where the armpit meets the body. We're gonna take the other arm, we're blading this, we're putting it kind of at the center of the deltoid. And both our fingers are gonna to come together here, and this will allow us to palpate up and down on this line to find the surgical neck. So the surgical neck, I describe it when you're feeling it as right where the T meets the golf ball. Um, and once we find that right here, we're going to go up about one centimeter, so one finger length above that, and this is going to be our site. So I can actually palpate this site really easily with my palm. It's the most prominent site or prominent part of the shoulder. When I'm inserting the needle, we're going to go uh, at a 90 degree angle to the skin. So I don't wanna be like pointing any uh, one direction if we're kind of right off the skin there at a 90 degree angle will be good to go. For the tibial site, the location is going to be two centimeters down and two centimeters uh, over from the tibial tuberosity. So to identify the site adequately, we're gonna take the leg and right at the center of the leg and right before the knee, you're gonna feel this little bump of bone. This is the tibial tuberosity. It is below the patella or the kneecap here. So once I find that, I'm gonna go two fingers down, that's about two centimeters and I'm gonna go two, two finger lengths or two centimeters over. And right here is going to be a flat part of the tibia. I'm going to take the needle and I'm once again going to do a 90 degree angle to the skin and go straight down. If we go too low, the bone density gets really, really tough um, and it will actually stall the driver, not allow you to insert the needle. And I've actually seen them uh, completely break off the hub of the needle and require pliers to get out. If you go too high, you'll put it into the joint capsule, which is once again, very bad um, for the patient and won't actually allow for adequate fluid administration. So tibial tuberosity, two centimeters down, so two finger widths down, two finger widths over, and it's gonna be 90 degree angle into the bone. This site is great for CPR in my opinion because you're not kind of in the way of everything that's going on. And then it is also really useful for patients that have a little bit more adipose tissue because this has, generally speaking, less on their body. So for a full demonstration of the IO, we're gonna go through step-by-step step what you need to set up and then actually go through the physical insertion on this model here. So the first thing we need to do is start getting our equipment ready. This is a humoral head that I have here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure I have my driver and you can see how much skin and adipose tissue we have here. So I want to go with the yellow needle. Um, this will work great for almost all of the humoral head insertions that you do. Next up, I'm going to have my loop and my flush. So I've already flushed this through. I don't wanna to touch this end once this cap is off because this is a sterile site technically. So we have that right next to it, ready to go. I'm going to have some way to clean the site and then I'm going to have the secure, which there is not enough skin on here to actually demonstrate how that works. So I won't actually be applying it to this patient. So we've identified the site, this is the hormonal site. So really quick to recap, we're gonna blade our hands, put them together. We're going to find the surgical neck. We're going to go a centimeter above that and that is going to be our main site. And we're going to make sure that the needle is 90 degree angle from the skin. So we've got the skin right there. We've got our site identified. I'm going to open whatever I have to sterilize that site. Make sure you're following your agency's procedures when you're doing this. Um, there's the aseptic technique, which is starting in the middle, working your way out say do this for as long as you can, like 30 seconds, letting that dry, especially if they're conscious, it will just make it sting a little bit more uh, when you're actually doing the procedure if there's still uh, stuff on the skin. I'm going to take my needle and driver, I'm gonna make sure that is functioning and I can actually take the cover off, I have the site identified, I'm going to come to the skin directly over the site 
and I'm going to insert it all the way to the bone. I don't want to start actuating the device until it is actually resting on the bone. I need to confirm on here that that last black mark, that last five millimeter mark is still exposed above the skin. If this has buried all the way to the hub with the adipose tissue, that means I need to go up one size in needles. And that is the most accurate way to size these needles, all right? So once we have that there, I'm going to do gentle downward pressure. Uh, a lot of the ability for this to go through is from the actual twisting motion, not from the downward pressure. So it's just a slight downward pressure. We're going to actuate the device, and this one has a ratcheting on it. And we're going to go until we feel a small give through the bone. So I got that give right there, it kind of sank. I'm not gonna go all the way through, I'm not gonna bury it to the hub because I might go through the other end of the bone. I'm then going to take this and I'm going to disconnect the hub here from the needle all the way out. This is a hollow bore. I can take this guy here, connect it to the lure lock on the needle um, you can tell this is in place because it's relatively stable. If it's just in the tissue, this will be wobbly. I can then try to aspirate. Now, you can aspirate blood out of this and marrow, and that can be used in laboratory studies. However, if you can't aspirate uh, in the case of IO, that doesn't mean it's misplaced. It just means uh, that you can't get it out. So that's not necessarily a sign that it doesn't work. I'm then gonna take this and I'm going to flush. Now, if the patient is conscious, I might wanna replace this flush with 2% lidocaine and flush it slowly over two minutes. What's painful about this procedure, con contrary to what you might think, is actually flushing fluids, increasing the pressure in the bone. It's not actually that painful to have the needle inserted even though it looks like it is. So I'm gonna flush that lidocaine slowly or if they're unresponsive, I'm actually going to flush this relatively quickly because it will open up the space. So we're gonna flush that in and you can see on this model, I have it uh, coming out the end because it is literally a hollow bone. And we're gonna flush this all the way and open up that cavity. I can then attach IV fluids to this. If you are running fluids and you're trying to drip an amount in, it's advisable to put on a pressure bag that will help it go in a little bit better. I can then take a device and actually put it over this needle to make sure it's not going to get knocked around or pushed out. That's where this guy comes in. Um, or you can take bulky dressings, put it on either side and tape them down. That's not manufacturer recommendation, that's just uh, kind of a in the field thing. If you absolutely have to, that works out just fine. This should not be left in a patient for more than 24 hours. So when we go to remove it, a lot of people make the mistake of just trying to twist it out with their hands and that will be very difficult to do. The best way to do this is to take your loop out, take a 10 ml syringe, doesn't necessarily have to be a flush, connect that, and you're going to pull back and twist, and it'll come right out, it just gives you a little bit more of a handle. You cannot start an IO on this extremity or on this bone for the next 48 hours. I've actually seen it where people have tried to, and it goes in one end of the bone, comes out the other hole that was made, and it's not effective at all and can cause a lot of pain and damage. So we're gonna take this, we're gonna dispose of this appropriately in a sharps container. Thanks for watching guys, that's all I have for this video. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments down below, and I will see you next week.